What I like best about Bertrand Russell's writing is that he's kind of a cheeky bastard. His short essay, Why I Am Not a Christian, is a clear and concise response to arguments for theism that were common during the first half of the 20th century, and it's also quite funny at parts. Here's his response to the argument from natural law, which says that the universe obeys laws, therefore there must be a lawmaker. Human laws are behests, commanding you to behave a certain way, in which way you may choose to behave or you may choose not to behave. But natural laws are a description of how things do in fact behave. And being a mere description of what they in fact do, you cannot argue that there must be somebody who told them to do that. Because even supposing that there were, you are then faced with the question, why did God issue just those natural laws and no others? Here's what he has to say about the argument from design. Since the time of Darwin, we understand much better why living creatures are adapted to their environment. It is not that their environment was made to be suitable to them, but that they grew to be suitable to it, and that is the basis of adaptation. There is no evidence of design about it. What Russell argues against that few other counter-apologists argue against is the idea that Jesus was an extraordinarily moral person. What's odd about this is that those who believe so don't try to live exactly by the moral teachings of Jesus, nor do they seem to think anyone ought to. Then Christ says, Give to him that asketh of thee, and from him that would borrow of thee, turn not thou away. That is a very good principle. Your chairman has reminded you that we are not here to talk politics, but I cannot help observing that the last general election was fought on the question of how desirable it was to turn away from him that would borrow of thee, so that one must assume that the liberals and conservatives of this country are composed of people who do not agree with the teaching of Christ because they certainly did very emphatically turn away on that occasion. Then there is one other maxim of Christ, which I think has a great deal in it, but I do not find that it is very popular among some of our Christian friends. He says, If thou wilt be perfect, go and sell that which thou hast, and give to the poor. That is a very excellent maxim, but as I say, it is not much practiced. I've heard apologists respond to this by saying that Jesus only told that one particular guy to sell his stuff. He didn't mean this as an instruction everyone should follow. But if this was only designed to apply to that one specific guy and is not relevant for anyone else, then what's the point of putting it in the gospel? Are we not supposed to learn anything from this? And if we are, what are we supposed to learn if it is not presented as an example to follow? Then he gets to the subject of hell. I do not myself feel that any person who is really profoundly humane can believe in everlasting punishment. Christ, certainly as depicted in the Gospels, did believe in everlasting punishment, and one does find repeatedly a vindictive fury against those people who would not listen to his preaching, an attitude which is not uncommon with preachers, but which does somewhat detract from superlative excellence. I must say that I think all this doctrine that hell fire is a punishment for sin is a doctrine of cruelty. It is a doctrine that put cruelty into the world and gave the world generations of cruel torture. And the Christ of the Gospels, if you could take him as his chroniclers represent him, would certainly have to be considered partly responsible for that. Then there is the curious story of the fig tree, which always rather puzzled me. You remember what happened about the fig tree? He was hungry, and seeing a fig tree afar off having leaves, he came, if haply he might find anything thereon. And when he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for the time of figs was not yet. And Jesus answered and said unto it, No man eat fruit of thee hereafter for ever. And Peter saith unto him, Master, behold, the fig tree which thou cursedst is withered away. This is a very curious story, because it was not the right time of year for figs, and you really could not blame the tree. Ironically, this story is analogous to how Yahweh seems to judge people on the basis of their innate nature, like original sin rather than things they can control. It's not just the case that Christianity has rules that seem to do nobody any good. There are also rules that seem to do harm. Supposing that in this world that we live in today, an inexperienced girl is married to a syphilitic man. In that case, the Catholic Church says, This is an indissoluble sacrament. You must stay together for life. And no steps of any sort must be taken by that woman to prevent herself from giving birth to syphilitic children. That is what the Catholic Church says. I say that that is fiendish cruelty. And nobody whose natural sympathies have not been warped by dogma, or whose moral nature was not absolutely dead to all sense of suffering, 
could maintain that it is right and proper that that state of things should continue. He finishes the essay by arguing in favor of a moral system that is not based on scripture or the supernatural. We ought to stand up and look the world frankly in the face. We ought to make the best we can of the world. And if it is not so good as we wish, after all, it will still be better than what these others have made of it in all these ages. A good world needs knowledge, kindliness and courage. It does not need a regretful hankering after the past or a fettering of the free intelligence by the words uttered long ago by ignorant men. It needs a fearless outlook and a free intelligence. It needs hope for the future, not looking back all the time toward a past that is dead, which we trust will be far surpassed by the future that our intelligence can create. description there's a link to my patreon for you generous and kind-hearted folk